Well, I hope you're able to process that song with uh, that powerful thought that uh, we need to be giving all that we are to the Good Shepherd, the Savior of our souls. And uh, we're going to move back now to Psalm 23, pick up where we left off last week. Last week, we talked about following that good shepherd, the shepherd of the crook, because he was a powerful shepherd. He's a personal shepherd. He's a providing shepherd, and he's a pathfinding shepherd. Today, we want to begin with verse 4, and we learn in verse 4 that he is a protecting shepherd. In verse 4, we read, even though, or even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your crook, they comfort me. Well, if you're ever out in Denver and you took a ride out Route 70 and you got to a particular spot through the foothills getting up into the mountains, there's a left-hand turn that you can take, and it's not a well-marked road. Uh, in fact, I don't even remember if there was a street sign or directions to find this place. But it's a road that goes up into the mountains, and it's very narrow. At times, there's only uh, the width for one car to pass. And uh, the further you go, you have the idea that you are going back in time to the Wild West, to the time when this place was settled, mining towns and hunting and trapping towns back in the mountains uh, of Colorado. And we were going back uh, during the daytime through this road. And I would advise if you ever went to a place like this, you want to first make sure you go in the daylight hours because it would be challenging to find your way back at night, even with headlights on your car, because it gets so dark in some of these places. And there was one particular place I will never forget. As we were going back to this town, back in the mountains, we came to this canyon. It's not a box canyon. It's an open-ended canyon. But for several miles, we drove through this place where the rock walls on the side of the road were so steep and the road was so narrow, you could almost reach out with both hands and touch the, the uh, cliffs that were on both sides of the road. And they were hundreds of feet high. In fact, even in the middle of the daylight, there was no sunlight hitting the bottom of the canyon floor. Well, we went to our destination. I'm glad we went through that place during the day, but uh, we returned in the evening. And at night, when we hit that canyon, it was lights out. I mean, totally pitch dark. And uh, even, again, with our headlights on, it was difficult to see, and the canyon walls were steep, and they were right there. If another car had been coming at us, I'm not sure that we could have got by without scraping either the wall or the car. It was just dark, and it was steep, and it was scary. And as I think of the words of David, even when I go through the darkest valley, I'm reminded of that place. And maybe some of you have been in dark places in your life. I think David was thinking that he had been in some places being chased by Saul, being chased by his son Absalom, where he was living in caves that were dark and cold and damp, and he saw no way out. The pain and suffering that he was going through was incredible. Both the emotional pain of being chased by those who he thought loved him and also the physical change by the exhaustion, just uh, running around the desert, trying to avoid capture and being killed. David writes about that, the darkest valley, the valley of death, the valley of pain, the valley of suffering, the valley of distress. Have you ever been in the darkest valley, place where you feel that the pain and discomfort of life is all around you? It's like the walls are closing in on you and you see no light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. In the desert of Israel, there are places like that. There are canyon walls that are steep, too steep for sheep to climb out of. And so what do they have to do? They have to depend 
and the good shepherd. They have to depend on the voice of the shepherd. When he calls them, they need to know his voice and they need to follow him. And when your life takes you into the darkest valleys, are you in a place where you can hear the voice of the good shepherd and you can follow him? We already know that he's proved himself to you by his power and provision. And so there's no reason to think that he can't protect you, even in the dark places where life sometimes takes you. I like the way the message translates the second line in that verse. It says this, Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You see, there are a couple of basic tools that the shepherd has. And uh, one is the uh, crook. And the other one is the rod. And the rod is a club. And the club was used to ward off animals that would attack the sheep, wolves or lions or bears, uh, or even a thief that might come. And the shepherd would use that club and, and ward them off. Now, we know that David had some other experiences. He was a slingshot artist. And the slingshot is good for trying to get rid of the enemy at a distance. But when the enemy is face-to-face, -face, you need some other kind of tools. And one of them is a club. And so uh, David would use that club. And he refers to that as his uh, rod. And the staff or the crook is that thing that makes you feel secure. It was a protective device. It was a kind of device that could pull you out of a tough spot, and the shepherd would use that. It was good for directing the sheep. It was good for keeping the sheep moving in the direction that the shepherd wanted the sheep to go, and of course, corralling them if necessary. You see, by way of application, the good shepherd has tools to ward off the enemy that might come face to face with you in these days. He has tools to keep you moving in the right direction. He has that rod and he has the staff, the crook. Remember, he's a pathfinding shepherd. He wants to keep you moving in the right direction. And when you are moving in the direction that he wants you to move in, he's right there protecting you all the way. He is a protecting shepherd and he uses that rod and staff to protect you even in the darkest places of life right now with this COVID-19 thing going on you might feel that you're in a very dark place I have to admit I'm getting a little bit of cabin fever we went out uh, for the first time in two weeks yesterday to get some groceries and uh, even with that, I wasn't real comfortable, I have to be honest with you. But I knew that God was going to protect us. I knew that there were things we needed to do. And uh, so we did them. And uh, here we are again today under the protection of the Good Shepherd. The second thing I want you to pay attention to today is also in verse 4. The second part of that, where David says, I fear no danger for you are with me. I want you to make note of the fact that he is not only a protecting shepherd, but he is a present shepherd. He is present. I fear no danger, for you are with me. Uh, when I was about 10 years old, my dad used to uh, take me hunting with him. I think that was about the first uh, time I went, about that age. And we would get up what seemed to be in the middle of the night, about 5 o'clock, and we would uh, load up and bundle up because of the cold weather. And we would drive an hour, hour and a half to his hunting spots. And uh, we would make our way back into the deep woods. And at that time, the sun wasn't quite up yet, and so it would be dark, and there'd be all kinds of jungle sounds. At least it sounded like that to a 10-year-old kid. But... I never really thought much about it because I was with my dad and uh, he was leading the way. And uh, in addition to that, he knew the woods and uh, he knew where he was going. And he would take me to a little spot 
where there was maybe a pine tree with some boughs kind of coming over the top. And he'd set me under there and he'd take some brush, pile it up around me. So I would be kind of sitting low behind this uh, pile of brush, making a little hunting blind, so to speak. And he'd say, no, you just sit here. And uh, if you see anything, just give a little whistle, not too loud, but just a little whistle. And he says, I'm going to go over here, just 100, 200 feet. And I have a blind there and I'm going to sit there. You might not be able to see me, but I'll be able to see you. And so he would go over and he'd sit in his blind and we'd wait for some deer to come by. And, you know, I never worried about it. In fact, I have to confess, I think a couple of times I nodded off trying to catch up on a little bit of sleep, getting up at that time of the day. But I didn't worry about things because dad was right there. He was present. And uh, even though I couldn't see him all the time, he was watching me. And I had no doubt of that. And you see, a good shepherd is very much like that. Uh, he's present with his sheep. That's why David could say, you are with me. I'm reminded of another psalm that David wrote when he said he is an ever-present help in time of trouble. And uh, right now, you might feel like you're sitting in the woods all alone, but be assured you have a heavenly father, a shepherd that is present and watching over you. He's a protecting shepherd, and he also is a present shepherd. But he's another kind of shepherd, and uh, you might find this word a little strange as I share it with you, but I think the application will make it clear. And uh, the third thing I want to share with you today about our shepherd is that he is a pharmacist shepherd. That's right, a pharmacist shepherd. If you look at verse 5, the shepherd says here, or David says about the shepherd, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. I like the message. The message says, you revive my drooping head. You see, there's three qualities of oil. There's a smoothness to the touch. You rub it on your skin and it makes it feel smooth. There's also a glossiness that brightens it to the sight. And then there's also a fragrance to it. So it gives off a perfume, an odor. That's uh, pleasing. Now, as you can imagine, uh, oil was used for soothing medicinal purposes. It was an ointment. It was used to treat the skin to bring some color out and some gloss to it. And then, of course, it was used as a perfume to sweeten the air. Now, I don't think the shepherd was so much uh, intent on the glossiness of the sheep or their smell. Well, he was interested in the medicinal use of it because as the sheep would wander around the desert and the crags of the rocks, they would get cut and scratched. And the oil was healing and soothing. And so he would use it. And so when he says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows He's saying that shepherd, when we get those knocks on the head, when we get those cuts and scratches that life often brings, the shepherd has a soothing ointment, a balm to bring comfort and healing. This reminded me of something that I, I think is very relevant in our day of the New Testament. And that is that there is an application of the anointing of the Holy Spirit on every believer. In John chapter 14 and verse 15, Jesus says this. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will send you or give you another counselor or comforter. The word is translated sometimes to be with you forever. He is the Spirit, the capital S, the Holy Spirit of truth. And as I said, sometimes the word counselor is replaced with the word comforter because it's the idea that the anointing of the Holy Spirit can bring comfort and healing into your life. To be sure, all followers of Jesus have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which assures us 
of his presence and his power of healing and comfort in our lives. In fact, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21, Paul says this. He says, now it is God who strengthens us together with you in Christ who has anointed us or who has poured out his comfort and healing on you. Isn't that awesome? And in 1 John 2, verse 20, John writes, but you have an anointing, that's the pouring out of oil, at least symbolically, by the Holy Spirit. And all of you know the truth. So what he is saying here by way of application for us is that the anointing of oil by the good shepherd and the injuries of the sheep that brought healing and comfort to them was much like the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit's anointing brings comfort and healing to us. And we can be assured of that. We know it is true. God's word is true. And he speaks the truth. And the truth here is that the good shepherd, the one with the crook, is like a pharmacist. And as he provided the healing oil and comforting oil for the sheep, the Holy Spirit does the same thing in our lives today. The good shepherd is a pharmacist, but he's also a pursuing shepherd. In verse 6, he says, only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. Would you rather have someone chasing you down with a club or a cupcake? Well, I think you probably know my answer to that. I'll take a cupcake every day and make it chocolate if you can. In fact, uh, Joy, I'm kind of missing those chocolate cupcakes that you make for our fellowship dinners. And uh, I haven't been able to talk Sheila into making any of those for me yet. However, she has made me some pies, so I have nothing to complain about. But there are two important uh, elements in this statement that are worth noting. The first one is that this pursuing shepherd, the one who pursues with goodness and faithfulness, all the days of our life remind us of the pleasantness that we're being pursued with. I think it's pretty cool that only goodness and love are following us. <laughs> the good shepherd is chasing us, but in his hands are the gifts of goodness, the gifts of a faithful love. That's what he's chasing us down with. Isn't that incredible? He's not looking to beat us over the head with the club. He's looking to bring goodness into our lives, and faithful love. Some translations say mercy. That's God giving us things that we don't deserve and that we haven't earned. But this reminds me of Matthew 7, where it says this, What man among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? See, it speaks to the pleasantness of the shepherd's pursuit. He's pursuing us with good things, and then it addresses the persistence of the good shepherd. He's pursuing us with those good things all the days of my life. Don't you think it's incredible to have a good shepherd who pursues you with the good stuff? And he does it with no time constraints. He's a protecting shepherd. He's a present shepherd. He's a pharmacist shepherd. He's a pursuing shepherd. And then finally today, he is a palatial shepherd. Again, maybe a funny use of that word, But he says in verse 6, I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Again, going to the message, Peterson writes, I'm back home in the house of Yahweh for the rest of my life. And again, this reminded me of another passage in the book of John where Jesus said these words, Your heart must not be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, mansions, palaces, homes. If not, 
I would have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you, a palace for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You see, the shepherd's just not leading you to some dugout in the desert. He's leading you to a palace where you will spend the rest of your days with Father God. What a good shepherd we have. He's a shepherd worth following. Amen? Well, at this time, I'm going to ask you to gather uh, your bread and your drink and uh, bring them around so we can gather around the Lord's table, at least in spirit, in the spirit of togetherness. And uh, as you're doing that, we're going to listen to a song by Fernando Ortega, Jesus Paid It All. We'll be back in a minute when you're done gathering your elements.